Turn to the uh, book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 18 through 24. We're going to wrap it up today. I hope you've enjoyed uh, our study of this marvelous book. <clears throat> We've uh, seen the Apostle Paul here in recent weeks admonishing the Ephesians and us to wear the armor of God. Uh, we have spiritual adversaries. And our armor is not uh, carnal in nature. Our, our armor consists of things like truth and righteousness and peace and faith. Furthermore, the Lord's given us a weapon. And uh, that weapon is, again, not carnal, not guns or bullets or grenades. Our weapon is the Word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. Today we look at another couple of weapons, the weapon of love and the weapon of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that just as you open the eyes of Elisha's servants, so you might open our eyes and hearts this morning to hear what you would say to us. Lead us in the way everlasting, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We pick up in, in mid-sentence, Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, <clears throat> but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I want to begin where the apostle ends, uh, namely verse 24, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Paul often began his letters and ended his letters with the words grace and peace. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, he would say, or just grace and peace to you. And he does so again here. We, we read of peace in verse 23 and grace in verse 24, but with a little different twist here in verse 24 because this time he uses the third person. And so it's a rather unique benediction. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And in using this third person, he puts a very special emphasis on the importance of the believer's love for Jesus. I think Paul understood something we quickly forget or overlook. What is the defining mark of a Christian or a believer? Some say, well, a Christian is a person who believes in Jesus. Some say a Christian is a person who can say the Apostles' Creed, who believes the Apostles' Creed. Maybe even the five points of Calvinism, if you're advanced, right? I think Paul would say, much more fundamentally, with all due respect to those other things, that a Christian, the clear defining mark of a Christian is that he or she is a person 
who's in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Belief is hard to see. Doctrine is hard to see. But love, love is impossible not to see. So what does love for Jesus look like? Well, several things come to mind from these closing verses. Love for Jesus, first of all, praise. Verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. When you love somebody, you talk to them, don't you? Talk to them a lot. You want to be with them. You have a relationship. You enjoy their company. And so there's very natural, instinctive, you don't have to be told to. You enjoy being with them. A person that loves Jesus will talk to Jesus frequently. Notice the fourfold repetition of the word all. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's like breathing air. It's so natural. It's instinctive. We don't have to be told to do it. All times, with all supplication, for all the saints, the believers in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and praise, talks to Him. Jesus loves His Father. Jesus prayed in a garden. Let us pray in our gardens. Jesus prayed on the cross. Let us pray on our crosses. The disciples prayed in the upper room. Paul prayed at the beach. Peter prayed on a rooftop. Peter and John prayed in the temple at all times for all the saints with all supplication. John Knox said prayer is simply the earnest and familiar talking with God. The catechism says it's like a child talking to its father. It's not ritual. It's not performance. It's the principle of all we do all the time and the means by which the other armor and weapons are made more effective. Elisha prayed, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And those eyes were opened and he beheld something great and glorious. All those enemies were there. He didn't see them naturally. But when Elisha prayed, opened his eyes, suddenly his, <laughs> his whole world and life view was changed and he saw the armies of God there to fight in his behalf. Years ago, I went to Romania in the mid-1990s. Jay, you've apparently been there. And I uh, went to a prayer meeting. I was there with four or five other people on a missions trip, a week-long missions trip. And one morning we went to a prayer meeting. Seventy-five women and one man. Most of the men were dead. In a massive, beautiful sanctuary on a cold November day, it was unheated, but there they were with coats and scarves and Clothing was old and worn, and so were they, because they had suffered greatly under the Ceausescu regime. They stood and prayed aloud, one at a time, in a language I didn't understand, but with a heart I fully understood. They didn't say prayers. They poured their hearts out, one by one, down the row and then they would sit after about 15 minutes and sing a hymn and they'd stand right back up pick up where they left off sit down and sing a hymn and they did that for at least an hour and I was the big missionary <laughs> that was there but realized pretty quickly I had a lot to learn from these spiritual mothers and fathers of mine Charles Spurgeon once wrote a little booklet called 
only a prayer meeting in which he lamented the declining attendance at church prayer meetings. Brethren, he wrote, we shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. We're quick to talk to others for whatever reason slow to talk to the Lord. What made Charles Spurgeon's church so powerful? Many of you have read the story of the boiler room prayer meeting where the saints gathered before the service and prayed for the ministry. Love prays. And second, love goes, verses 19 and 20. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly, twice he uses that word boldly, as I ought to speak. Elsewhere, Paul says that love constrained him. Love compelled him. He had to go. He had to let his light shine. He couldn't put his light under a bushel. He had to tell other people. And here he was imprisoned, the great apostle, because it mattered so much to him to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And he wanted to go more. His enthusiasm wasn't dampened a bit by being incarcerated. And so the great apostle says, pray for me too. We all need prayer. Pray for me too, that I may go. More gospel, more preaching, more evangelism, more salvation. More churches established, the kingdom of God growing. That's what the apostle lived for. And that's why he was in prison, an ambassador in chains. Sometimes when we suffer, sometimes when there's a little persecution or a little opposition, we wonder if we've missed the will of God. And maybe we have, but not Paul. Paul was in prison precisely because he was doing God's will, and he wanted to do more of it. He had other places to go. Other sheep have I, he would say, not of this fold. Many of you watched the coronation of King Charles, and you watched the uh, dignitaries process down that center aisle. And if you watch carefully, you may have noticed that they trod over the burial plate of David Livingston, whose uh, burial plate is very prominently displayed there in Westminster Abbey. I wonder, as I watched that, I wonder how many of them even knew who David Livingston was. He was a man with a successful medical practice in the British Isles, but he left it because he felt the call of God to go to Africa and serve as a missionary and suffer as a missionary. And so he went and he, he served there for many, many years. And on that burial plate, if you could read the words, are these brought by faithful hands over land and sea, here rests David Livingston, missionary, traveler, philanthropist. For 30 years his life was spent in an unwearied effort to evangelize the native races, to explore the undiscovered secrets, to abolish the desolating slave trade of Central Africa. And on the side of that plate are the words I just quoted a moment ago, other sheep have I which are not of this fold. He died in 1873 in Africa, found on his knees where he'd probably been praying. And the Africans loved him because he loved them. So they buried his heart in Africa while his body is entombed in Westminster Abbey. He endured fevers on at least 30 occasions. One arm hung limp because he'd been attacked by a lion. His wife died of malaria. And yet David Livingston once said, I have never made a sacrifice. 
Livingston wouldn't let suffering stop him. The Apostle Paul wouldn't let prison stop him. Jesus wouldn't let threats stop him. He knew what awaited him in Jerusalem, but set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. Love prays and love goes. You may have heard about the Moravian missionaries who went to, uh, to South America and entered the leper colonies knowing they'd never be able to leave but because it was the only way to reach the lepers, they entered their colonies. And other Moravians in the West Indies sold themselves into slavery because they knew it was the only way to reach the slaves with the gospel. Love prays and love goes. And finally, love cares. Verses 21 and 22. So that you also may know how I am, how I am, and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. If you remember from the book of Acts, when Paul bid the elders in Ephesus farewell. It was a very emotional time. And there was much weeping. And they fell upon Paul and kissed him. They loved him. And he loved them. And behind it all was their mutual love, incorruptible, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Love prays, love goes, love cares. And so Paul was sending this man Tychicus to, to let them know how he was doing because they were so deeply concerned for him. Paul was a Jew. They were Gentiles. Very different people, but brought together by this incorruptible love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And you know, one might say that's the point of Ephesians. Think back, Jew and Gentile. God, through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, had broken down the wall of our hostility and made them all part of one, one family of God, the household of God. Because as different as they were, they had some very important things in common. Chapter 1, they were all dead in sin, all destined for the wrath of God all far away. Chapter 2, but God. <laughs> Remember those great words? But God quickened and raised and seated them in the heavenly places and sent his Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And he sealed them with the Holy Spirit. By grace they were saved through faith, that not of themselves. It was a gift of God because of the immeasurable, unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you hear the apostles' love for the Lord Jesus Christ? His wasn't a casual faith. His wasn't a lukewarm following. It was a fervent, passionate relationship he had with his Savior, whose blood was spilled in his behalf too. In Malcolm Muggeridge's memoirs, there's a very magnificent passage where he describes a time when his wife Kitty was quite ill and expected to die. Muggeridge writes, it was a cruelly anxious time from every point of view. She was fighting to live, face pared down to a skull, her body a yellow skeleton. While I was there, the doctor came in and said she had lost a lot of blood in the night and needed a transfusion. It was before the days of bottled plasma. Wouldn't I do for a donor, I asked. My blood was taken into my 
infinite relief to prove satisfactory. And there and then, by a procedure that would seem grotesquely primitive nowadays, I was joined to my wife by a tube with a pump in the middle so that I could actually watch the blood being pumped out of me into her. Never in all our life together had I so completely and perfectly and joyously experienced love's fulfillment as at that moment. For the first time, I truly understood what love meant. Isn't that a great picture of the gospel? Somebody else's blood has given us life. The Lord Jesus Christ, can we be cavalier? Can we be lukewarm? Can we say with a hymn writer, My Jesus, I love thee. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. Paul was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that love prayed and it went and it cared and so must I, ours. We must care and we must go and we must pray. And we pray all the time for all the saints. We pray for the kingdom to come and his will to be done. We pray for arguments and strongholds and lofty opinions that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God to be demolished. And we pray for the glory of God to be revealed. And we pray that we'll not be led into temptation, but that we'll be delivered from evil. And that through us, glory and honor and praise and adoration might be given to our blessed Redeemer who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord God, our Father, we pray that you would increase our love for your Son, our Savior, that you would soften our hearts, that you would, on this Pentecost Sunday, pour out your Spirit upon us all once again that we would be a broken and humble and contrite people who love our Savior and who eagerly desire to serve our Savior and spread the word and go far and wide and, and um, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. May suffering not impede us or discourage us. May we lift high the cross, take our stand beneath it, survey it in all of its glory. Pour contempt on all of our pride, our richest gain. May we count but loss, rubbish, for the sake of knowing Christ. We bring before you, as the apostle prayed for all the saints all the time, we pray for the saints as well, our saints here, and ask for your mercies and blessings upon them. Emma Thompson, Grant her healing and recovery from surgery. Charlie Smith, Landy Campbell, Prudy Nickel, Linda Stubblefield, uh, Edna Pearson, Don Birdwell and Wes Schaffner, Ike Bradley, Joyce Wood. Bless each of these in their own unique situations and have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon Isabel Hearn as she mourns the loss of a dear friend. Bless Chuckles Collins and her, her son-in-law, and we pray that you give Chuckles and that whole family uh, great peace. We do pray for your glory to be revealed, Father, for all flesh to see it once again, and for you to hasten the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess your Lordship. And on this holiday weekend, we do give thanks for those who have suffered who've lost loved ones we we thank you for those who gave their lives and we pray for our country and pray that you look with faith and mercy uh, grace and mercy upon us O oh lord that we'd be a nation under god that we would would desire righteousness that you'd bless us with righteous and godly uh, leaders both local and national so father we thank you for this study and pray that you your spirit 
will write these words in our hearts that we might go forth and serve you, that we might not sin against you, but that we might give glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords. In whose name we pray, amen.